Hi, this is DeSalani and uh, welcome to the most impromptu video I think uh, I've ever recorded. Uh, yeah, today is the last day of 2022. I didn't mean to record another video, but uh, outside, I'm looking outside and it's grey and rainy and everyone else is doing their own thing. So I just felt like talking about this today, which is that video. Um, every channel has that video, that one video. And today I'm going to be talking about mine. Uh, what do I mean about that video? Uh, it's usually something that was, uh, you know, early in the channel's history. It may be slightly out of character or a bit different to everything else that's there. And you always wonder kind of what what, what was that all about? <laughs> so today I'm talking about mine. Yeah, so my that one video was uploaded um, on the 17th of September in 2020. So that's kind of right in the middle of all that, that COVID lockdown stuff, really. Um, those of you who are familiar with the channel will know that I, I really only started kind of uh, pushing out videos um, over the last kind of three, four months of this year, uh, kind of September 2022. So, yeah, there was kind of a two year gap between me uploading that first video <laughs> and me actually kind of, you know, putting my own content up here. Anyway, the, what that first video is, is um, it's basically a, a vinyl rip of, uh, sorry, there we go, this. This is uh, Starve the Eagle. It's one of the few 12-inch uh, single EP releases by Welfare Heroin. So Welfare Heroin, who were Welfare Heroin? They were basically a kind of a very uh, limited uh, studio project of someone who wasn't really known as being a musician. He was a journalist. And that is Delhi for Delhi. Yeah, I say Welfare Heroin were Delhi's kind of studio project. They did. They did play very sporadic dates, and uh, I did happen to see them. Um, this is quite a big thing here. I'm just going to try and pull it up so you can see it. I'm sure there'll be some focusing issues. Um, this is a poster. There we go. That's centered. Um, this was my bloody Valentine's gig on the Loveless tour. Uh, I went to this uh, concert. Uh, it was at UEA in Norwich, the University of East Anglia, local to me, uh, Sunday the 1st of December. And you'll see there that Silverfish were the main support and kind of added there, I'm just trying to get where you can see it, added there at the bottom in felt-tip pen were Welfare Heroin, who were bottom of the bill that day. So yeah, I seem to be one of those rare people who uh, actually owns a Welfare Heroin record and uh, saw them play live. Yeah, I think the reason I uploaded that video originally was because of Delhi. Um, he wrote for the enemy um, all through kind of the mid to late 1980s into the early 90s. And he contributed music reviews to the enemy and other music publications for many years after that. But I remember him from that period in the late 80s when he was one of the most interesting voices uh, writing for the enemy. He was um, one of the few black journalists of the enemy and he was kind of voracious in his support for hip-hop. Uh, he was one of the first people to interview Public Enemy. Um, he pushed artists like Della Soul and the Jungle Brothers and all those other early kind of late 80s hip-hop artists. Uh, he pushed them with the enemy and the enemy was kind of a little bit resistant at the time because it didn't know quite what to make of hip-hop. Yeah, got Public Enemy, their first cover on the enemy, I think, and um, got them some of their earliest UK exposure, which was invaluable in their kind of their evolution, their kind of their success. But Delhi was more than that. He wasn't just all about hip hop. Um, he was very into kind of his uh, his noise rock. He had very cool taste. Uh, he was into the Young Gods and Einsturz and the Neubat and Swans, Sonic Youth. Yeah, he really had a great ear for anything that was kind of slightly, you know, outre, slightly uh, different. He appreciated, you know, noise in all its forms from, you know, the clatter of those kind of public enemy records to, you know, just the kind of the wall of noise of bands like Swans and Sonic Youth. Yeah, I remember um, reading his review um, of Bob Mould's debut solo album, Workbook. It was here in this issue of The Enemy. It's the issue dated the 8th of July, 1989. I'd been kind of getting into this kind of music and I read that review and uh, immediately kind of went out and bought the album. Uh, and it's one of the, one of those records that kind of opened me up and changed, changed the way that I was uh, 
listening to music um yeah i mean you'll see <laughs> even to this day i'm wearing a, a husker do hoodie um so yeah his writing i found very influential certainly on me at that time he had a passion that came across he had a way of writing his taste was cool um and he was pretty switched on about you know what was happening in the musical world he was also very switched on i think to some things that some people at like the enemy were quite happy to kind of uh try and sideline or look past um he infamously flagged up some of uh, morrissey's less kind of pleasant you know tendencies or leanings in 1992 you know this is around about the time that morris was morrissey was singing songs you know with lines like you know england for the english um and i think the rest of the enemy kind of editorial stuff were quite were quite just blinded by all this because of you know the success and the respect afforded the smiths and morrissey and uh Daly kind of pushed that story and got it onto the cover. And uh, sure enough, Morrissey didn't talk to the enemy for 12 years following that incident. As the years have gone on, we've, we've seen Morrissey in a different light. And I think, to Daly's credit, it seems to be one which is slightly more akin to his take on Morrissey than um, to your kind of average Smiths fan from the mid 80s. Anyway, yeah, back to that one video. So, um, during that period, kind of the lockdown period of 2020, um, in August, I think it was, uh, some news stories started uh, coming out about Delhi Fidelli's death. And the most upsetting and the oddest thing about this was that he had actually died in March of 2018. And uh, his death had pretty much gone unreported. Yeah, he'd succumbed to uh, stomach cancer. And... Um, never having known or interacted with Delhi in any way, I have to base my kind of, um, my understanding of him from, from what his friends and colleagues have written about him. And apparently, despite being very garrulous, very larger than life, very effusive, very talented, he was also in some ways quite unreliable. People would say, oh, I'd arranged to meet Delhi and, you know, he didn't show up and then you'd see him a few months later and he'd be very apologetic. I think he was someone who kind of kept himself to himself within the enemy offices in some ways. Yeah, I think he was the kind of person who found it all too easy to kind of just, you know, slip out of people's view. And that seems to be what happened. Yeah, I found this quite upsetting because I, I found a lot of Delhi's pieces, you know, very, very influential. Um, they really spoke to me at the time. And it just seemed so sad that, that, that he could just pass without anyone knowing. And um, it took, you know, a year and a half before anyone was even aware that he was gone. And I guess the thing that really hit home to me was um, things just, they just fade from view. It's very easy to lose things. We think that just because we hold something dear, that the world holds it dear. And that isn't always the case. People forget. Sometimes there's a smaller audience for some things and yeah, they just fade away. So I very carefully and very rigorously had a scout around to see what the copyright issues might have been of me ripping that Welfare Heroin EP and uploading it to YouTube. I could find it nowhere on any streaming platforms at all. So I took a chance and I just kind of ripped the vinyl, slapped together a quick video with some still images of the artwork, uploaded it and thought, well, let's see if anyone wants to listen to that. Yeah, no copyright strikes, and a few people did listen to it. In fact, it, it's amounted quite a few kind of viewing, listening hours uh, over those two, two and a half years. But for me, it meant something a bit different. That idea that things fade from view, it really kind of uh, resonated with me. And I started thinking at that point about all, all the music uh, that really meant something to me and how I was beginning to see less and less of it represented in the media talked about and that idea kind of kind of took hold really you know that was the grain of sand if you like in the in the oyster and i took my sweet time it took me two years remember this was during a, an extended period of uh you know covid lockdown there were issues surrounding homeschooling and family members who needed help so during that period i started to kind of formulate a plan of what this channel could be about and the kind of thing that i'd like to put out on it and I guess that's why I'm talking about it now. It feels like a good time to just talk about that 
it's the end of the year, uh, the end of the year when I seriously started um, uploading videos and content to this channel. Yeah, so every time I look at that content pane, if I'm, you know, looking across my viewing figures, I see that welfare heroin video. I see it way back there in 2020, long before I published anything else. And it just reminds me of kind of why I'm doing this. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's all I think. Uh, like I said, this was just a very, very impromptu video. I literally just plonked myself down in front of a camera and hit record. Um, but today was just one of those days when, you know, it's the last day of the year. You maybe feel a bit reflective. You start looking back. And I thought it was time for me to talk about, you know, that one video. Anyway, yeah, a bit of a random drop today, but there you go. Um, I'll say goodbye for now. And I wish everyone watching a very happy new year. And uh, I'll see you soon on the channel. Bye for now.